I'm Michael Wood. I'm a filmmaker and programme maker. I'm part of an independent film company and have been for 30 years. Make films for BBC and PBS and worldwide. Um, I'm a professor of history at Manchester University as well, sort of as a part-time. Um, so, and I'm a writer of history books. And inside the shrine, you're reminded again of the old customs of Mesopotamian worship in the glittering Holy of Holies, whose magnificence distantly reflects something of that old pre-Islamic world. Feel what a dynamic force Iraqi Islam, Shia and Sunni has been through history. I studied history at Oxford and, and did postgraduate research in Oxford. And actually, when I was a student, I, I studied that period of the origins of Islam, you know, right back at the beginning, 7th century, and always found it fascinating. And I travelled and filmed in Sunni Muslim, predominantly Sunni Muslim countries. Um, but I suppose my first real encounter with uh, Shiism, like a lot of people, came after the 79 revolution in, in Iran, and when suddenly the question of what the Shia faith was and the beliefs which distinguished it from the Sunni world and became really important and fascinating. So I think everybody was, was um, fascinated then in my line of business, whether you were a historian or a, or a journalist. Uh, but then almost immediately, of course, uh, the, the revolution was transformed by all sorts of... Uh, things and then by the war between Iran and Iraq which is such an immense tragedy so through the the 80s that was just it was horrendous but as soon as the the war was over I had a chance to go to Iraq at the end of the 80s and that was the first and only time I've been to Kerbala funnily enough which uh, I went a couple of times right at the end of the 80s the last time in the winter of 89 and traveled through southern Iraq went to the marshes, actually stayed in the marshes at that time, and visited Kerbala, all of it then under Saddam's power. You know, really, you were very aware of the military presence everywhere you went. Uh, so that, uh, and by then I'd already got interested in the, the Shia faith. I'd come to London from Manchester in the in the late 80s and there used to be a Muslim bookshop in Charing Cross Road called Al Hoda and uh, and you know that feeling when you kind of somebody opens a door to a world that you knew very little about and anyway the Al Hoda bookshop and a library ticket at Soas Library were the things that did it for me and I used to sit there in the Soas Library with the open shelves of the stacks and going wow I didn't know anything about this you know and you pick up books by People like the great French Islamic scholar Henri Corbin wrote a lot about the Shia world. And, and you discover that what you thought you knew about you know, Islamic culture and, and uh, uh, philosophy and all these things, just there's huge gaps. You know, we're all taught things about the great, the great figures in Islamic intellectual history. And what you don't realize is that this tradition carried on through the... 15, 16, 17, 18, 1900s with, uh, uh, in the Shia world, th th there's an incredible period of uh, cultural regeneration through that whole period as well. And so I got really hooked on all that stuff and used to often have to pick them up in French in those days because they weren't available in English translation. But I got really interested in all that. So that was all, uh, all built up and then I had a chance to go to the heartland of the Shia the, in, into southern Iraq. And... and um, that was really great, really great, even though the circumstances for the Shia at that time under Saddam, of course, was a Sunni ruler with a Sunni minority power over Iraq, as they had been for centuries. It was really, really interesting. And when the 91 war happened and the risings of, in Iraq, 14 of the 19 provinces rose against uh, Saddam. Imam Khoi gave his fatwa asking the Iraqi people to commit no acts of violence or revenge or no looting, no this, behave to your neighbours of whatever faith with justice, you know. It was an incredible moment. And then the Allies allowed the revolt to be crushed. And um, 
it was at that point that I got involved with the Shia community in London through the, the Khoi Foundation. Well, after the 91 uprising and what happened in the South was so terrible, you know, and the, the, the Kabbalah was almost destroyed by the Saddam's army. Um, vast numbers of people were killed, 300,000 people was the estimate. And then he instituted this thing of draining the marshes to destroy the society in the, the, the southern marshes. And as things unfolded that autumn, I got in touch with Yusuf al Khoui, whose grandfather was the uh, Imam of the whole Shiite world, Grand Ayatollah al Khoui. And I wrote to Yusuf and said, you know, we're a film company, you know, if there's anything we can do to, to help, you know, there have been these moves to get a no-fly zone as they had against the Kurds and it didn't happen. So I got involved with Yusuf and the foundation and wrote journalism. We did short films for the world this week, Week in Politics. If important figures from the Shiite world came to London, we whizzed them around to the world's BBC World Service or the Voice of America or all that. People like Hussein Sharistani, who was living in, in Tehran at that time. And, um, and of course, we had a lot of public demonstrations and um, you know, big demonstrations in Trafalgar Square. Um, so, um, where you met a lot of really great figures, you know, the exiles, famous scholars, Baro Loom and uh, other great people. And uh, women were a very dynamic part of it as well, of course. It was very progressive, it seemed, at that time. And uh, then we made a big film called Saddam's Killing Fields, which was in, in America was called Saddam's Latest War. And I went to Kurdistan to interview survivors of what had happened in the south who'd got up to Kurdistan. Um, uh, and uh, with friends from the foundation. And then Yusuf and I went to Tehran and we went down to Susangar Awaz and Susangar and we went into the marshes through the Iranian side um, without permission to, to actually go into the military zone, but because he was a, a Al Khoi was his name, you know, they, it was a, like a password and we got through into the, into the marshes and we interviewed survivors there. And that was a very harrowing time, and the the, um, the documentary got a lot of awards and um, was shown many, many times in different places. The, even the script was translated into Arabic and circulated in southern Iraq as a sort of um, you know bootleg kind of thing, you know. And uh, it was it was a plea for the what was happening in the south to be taken seriously by the Allies who had betrayed the, essentially the people of South Iraq in 91. Saddam had had an, a jet on the tarmac to fly to exile in Algeria, I think, and uh, they, they let him stay in power because the Americans and the Saudis and their allies feared a Shiite majority in, in Iraq. And uh, of course it was a fatal error, you know. There was a possibility in 91 that a democratic Iraq might have arisen without the terrible suffering that it had endured. So, so it was a catastrophic error. I can remember being in the marshes um, in that incredibly hot summer of 1993, and I met a um, Shiite cleric there from Najaf who um, uh, said one night that he feared that if this went on, for another 10 years, then the goodness of the people would be destroyed, was the phrase he used, you know, and we sat there, and that was the summer of 93, 10 years before the second invasion and the, the horrors that have, have happened. So it was a really fatal moment, you know. So, uh, so well, through that period, we got, you know, just helping a little bit, sort of publicizing, making films. The films were shown in America. We got an interview with the, you know, White House, and uh, um, so that's what we were doing. But in the process, I got obviously very close to all my friends in the London Shiite community, and uh, especially with the mosque in Queen's Park, you know, where the Khoi Foundation is. And my wife and I, and sometimes our kids, we'd go to Ashura, and or the, you know, it was quite touching actually to see them cooking for Hussein in the streets of Queen's Park, you know, with the great tureens of food that you'd see in Najaf and Kabbalah. And, uh, and there it was being cooked in London. And, uh, and it was uh, a 
tragic time in a way because you know I remember one Ashura in the early to mid 90s around that time when they'd got black and white photographs of hundreds and hundreds of people of the families of the people, exiles in London who, all of whom had died under Saddam and the whole of the great prayer hall in Queen's Park was covered with these photographs as well as the mosque being hung with black for, for Hussein you know um, so that was a very tough time and I, I wrote the obituaries for some of the leading figures who died under Saddam Taghi al Khoui, um, Garawi um, Imam Sada um, al Khoui himself of course later Majid who has died under the you know the second invasion so it was all very that was tough really for, for the friends but what you understood from it as a non-Muslim uh, was that um, the lamentations for that took place in Ashura had an immense emotional intensity immense intensity and the lament uh, seemed to be about the fate of the people of Iraq you know you were you were lamenting something that took place in 680 in the our calendar but you were also lamenting the the tragedies of, of here and now and um, that was something that I, I came to understand about what the Shia lamentations were about do you know what I mean so they're about a tragic human destiny in some ways you know they transcend any of one faith you know and, those forms of lamentation are very deeply ingrained, especially in the culture of the Near East, in Jewish culture as well, you know, but of course more than any in the Shia. Um, you're dealing with a really tragic event that took place in real history, you know, a handful of people, I can't remember exactly how many is it, so about 70 people with him. And that, 72. 72. And um, uh, outnumbered by vast army and uh, deprived of water women and children so it's a, it's a tragic t terrible story and uh, uh, so and obviously you learn the importance of that to the Shiite community and it's a real event not a mythic event um, and of course all Shia will tell you that it's about uh, justice in the end you know and uh, I remember people at the time old, old people in Queen's Park saying to me oh you know You'd never shake the hand of a tyrant, you know, and all these sort of things. So um, you learn the, the importance of that story to the Shiite community, I think. And um, uh, it's, uh, you also see how that narrative replicates itself in history, you know. And uh, I've met a few communities in my life who are more aware of history than the Shia because of your, part of your identity comes from history. It's history that you hold on to so powerfully, and and um, so it's like a parable, isn't it? You know. So, um, but you know, they're very human things. You know, speaking as a non-Muslim and I'm not a religious person, you know, these are very, very human things. Um, and uh, uh, the the um, I remember one strange. This is just a little personal story, but I've been to Kabul, you see, and I'd been and I'd been to the tomb of Imam Hussein. I'd been inside the mosque and uh, in a time when Saddam's troops were on guard everywhere and then I'd sat in London and made the film, the first film, big film we did and we'd got this incredible footage in Tehran shot by two brothers from the mosque of Imam Hussein as Saddam's troops closed in and this is a very very famous piece of footage now and we got an original copy of this from Tehran and you saw the horror of it and the, peop the, the improvised medical station inside the mosque and the, the screaming of the people and the tanks coming in and very, very powerful. And you saw also the shattering aftermath of the destruction shot by an Australian film crew who just ran the camera as they were allowed in the following month and they ran the camera in all the way up to the great mosque and you... Um, uh, you saw the shattered mosque and the, every building on that great long approach, you know, that wonderful approach when you walk all the way up to the, the which is now is filled again with pilgrims and Ashura. Then it was empty, every building smashed, 
and the mosque itself, you know, the, the, the names of the imams, uh, machine gun, the blood on the walls, the whole thing, it was an incredible vision. And, and I, I remember then being involved with the community and, I, and having, uh, having a dream. And the, in the dream, I had, uh, I'd gone back to Kabbalah and uh, I had walked up that long pathway and all, all the only people there, everything was closed up. And the only people there were the Saddam soldiers. And I was ushered in a long circuitous route to come into the, the mosque, um, which had been restored, but was kind of empty and sealed off, you know. And I went almost to the heart of the mosque, but didn't get to the tomb. And then um, uh, I could hear some commemoration was still happening as if the life of the mosque had not been destroyed. But then I was ushered away on a circuitous route away and out along a long passageway in which I realized the whole of the Kabbalah was now surrounded by water as if it was on an island in a lake, you know. And I wasn't allowed to go to the center uh, in my dream. And uh, I remember feeling a kind of a desire to go to lament, you know, because of the tragedies that we'd seen. And I remember Shiite friends of mine saying, oh, you know, the, the hidden imam has come to you in a dream, you know, and we all kind of laughed about it sitting in a bar in Tehran, you know. But um, these things are powerful effect, you see, because it was an immense tragedy. So I suppose what I'm saying to you is my response in a personal way, was that um, we had, uh, even at a distance, we'd not suffered what, we'd no idea of the suffering of our friends and their families and everything else, but because we'd participated in it and we'd received the news and we'd been to Ashura over those years and we'd had some sense of it, then you are emotionally bound up with it all. I think, um, uh, you know, it has that impact and people understand that, I think. And people are much more aware about the Shia community now. You know, when we started doing our stuff in 1991, um, very, there was, wasn't enough knowledge about the Shia world and its ideas. And, and it had been very much tarred with a particular way of seeing uh, Shiism because of the Iranian revolution. And there was, a very, there was an anti-Shiite kind of thing in a lot of Western journalism because of the Iranian Revolution. Nobody quite understood, you know, could see that actually, um, you know, the West and the Americans had played the major role in the overthrow of the Iranian democracy in the 1950s. They'd supported the Shah's tyrannical autocratic regime. You know, that there were many reasons why the um, Iranian Revolution took place, and uh, but the Americans be weren't prepared to see that, and of course the Iranian Revolution, for a moment, had been full of hope and optimism, and for a variety of reasons, um, that that hope was lost in many important ways, but it was. The disaster was compounded almost immediately by the war between Iran and Iraq, in which the West supported Iraq. So um, a series of absolutely enormous tragedies kind of accelerated that thing. You know. So, so there was that was the background to the 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 very anti-Shia mood that was in a lot of places, which which in journalism in the West and all that, and that. That underlays some of the reaction to the leaving Saddam in power in, in, in 1991, you know, to the, the reasons for that. People know much more about it now. And it's much better known to in, in the Western world. But um, people need to know more. And one of the things we've been talking about recently with the Hoi Foundation has been this very poor coverage of the Shia on, on BBC educational websites. And we've been trying to encourage them to do um, a, a really better coverage in conjunction with the Open University so, um, and to make more films about the Shia beliefs, the rituals, the ideas about what the faith is and so on. So, um, and it's slow progress, you know, they don't seem to understand 
what the problem is. Uh, and so I think, I do think the story still, uh, for everybody, has a great power um, and, uh, and is a meaningful story to people of other faiths and religions. Um, but more important than that still is, is actually understanding each other better, empathy and all this stuff. I'm sure that story will, can play part of it, but it, you know, what, why we got involved was above all because of um, discrimination against the Shia, um, uh, the political discrimination, social and religious discrimination. These things are still really, really important. Um, uh, as you hardly need to be told on this channel, um, the, the fermenting of anti-Shia feeling from uh, Wahhabi and Salafi um, forces in the world is very severe at the moment. And I'm not talking abstractly about that because you know, I film everywhere in the world and I see it everywhere. You know, our friend, Shia friends in Pakistan are frightened of doing rituals in public now because of the antagonism. You know, everywhere you go there is this, you know, you just look at what's happening in the Gulf, for example, in Bahrain and Saudi and, you know, there are major, major issues still. So um, that's the area that has most concerned me, I suppose.